Hello, this is lecture two for the items which will help you understand information in the results section of the Marie framework. So I do get that we really hate this stuff, but unfortunately it's one of those cases where what does not kill you makes you stronger. So this lecture we'll be discussing odds ratios, relative risk, relative risk reduction, absolute risk reduction or absolute risk difference, number needed to treat, I will discuss how to read forest plots, and I will discuss absolute versus relative results. So without further ado, let's get started with this alphabet soup. With odds ratios, we are really looking at how much more likely is it that someone who is exposed to a treatment or medication or procedure will develop the outcome as compared to someone who is not exposed. So odds ratio is really the probability an event will happen versus the probability the event will not happen. If you bet at a racetrack, if you do sports betting, you understand odds ratios. They are not intuitive to most people. They are not simple percent calculations. And that's one caution I would give you is we have to be really careful when we explain the results using odds ratios. In your folder, there is a document that is optional reading, which explains how odds ratios are calculated. And for purposes of this, you do not have to do the calculation or know how to do it. However, if you understand math or like math, then first year, not normal. But let me show you something that's very helpful to me. Let's say I don't remember hazard ratios or odds ratios or risk reduction. I'm going to put in odds ratios. And lo and behold, the first thing that will come up is a Wikipedia reference. And this has become my best friend when I get confused on these topics because it does happen. Okay, what I'm going to do is I could spend time reading all this piece. Here's what I like because the math is what helps me make sense of the data. When I come down to this table and if I put in risk ratio or absolute risk reduction, if I scroll to the bottom of the screen that opens, if I go to Wikipedia, it's going to come to this table. And what they explain in this table is, let's say you had a group that was your experimental group or your treatment group and a control group and you had a certain number of events. So let's go back to the example that was on that slide. It said cigarette smoking and the risk of lung cancer. So my events would be lung cancer. In this group there was a total number of people that would represent the value of 15 out of 235. So there were 150 people in the treatment group and 250 people in the control group. Next, I look at how many cases of lung cancer occurred in each group, how many patients didn't develop lung cancer, and I can calculate an event rate. So E, experimental event rate and C control exper excuse me control event rate now we're focusing on odds ratios so do you see how odds ratio was highlighted down here and it says the way I actually do the math for an odds ratio is take the EE so I'd come up here and do 15 divided by the EN divided by the people who didn't have the event and then I mathematically divide that by the number of events in the control group compared to the number of non-events in the control group. So if you like the math piece, you've got how to do the math here. All right, back to our slides. So for odds ratios then, we're looking at probabilities that something will happen compared to something, the probability that it will not happen. 
when are we going to see odds ratios? Well, odds ratios will most commonly be reported when we look at case control studies. So hopefully that's a familiar term. You should understand terms such as systematic review. Remember that evidence hierarchy. Randomized control trial. Case control study. So if I had a case control study, it's probably going to report the results as odds ratios. It may also be used to report the results of a meta-analysis, and those are becoming more and more common. So it's likely that as you're looking at a study, you're going to find something that reports results in odds ratios. So how do I approach the process of analyzing odds ratios? So here was a study that looked at the risk of diarrhea after eating raw hamburger or not eating raw hamburger and it found an odds ratio of 3.2. So I need to know, I found a result in this study, an odds ratio of 3.2. What does that mean? Well, an odds ratio of equal to 1 means there was no effect. So remember we said anytime you have odds ratio, if you had 3.2 divided by 3.2, it would be 1, meaning there was no difference. Or if the odds ratio then is 1, it means there's no difference between the treatment group and the control group. If the odds ratio is less than 1, it means the outcome, in this case diarrhea, was less likely among those who ate the raw hamburger compared to those who did not. An odds ratio greater than 1 means the outcome diarrhea is more likely among those who were exposed who ate the raw hamburger compared to those who did not eat the raw hamburger. So we have an odds ratio greater than 1. That means the odds of this outcome were higher in the treatment group compared to the control group. An odds ratio can be as large a value as the value of infinity. So if I had an odds ratio of 1,265,437, it would be pretty much the same as saying it's almost certain that if you ate raw hamburger, you would develop diarrhea. How about an odds ratio of only 1.02? It would be correct to say there is a slightly higher chance of developing diarrhea after eating raw hamburger than those who did not eat raw hamburger. So for this example then, those who ate raw hamburger had a greater chance of developing diarrhea than those who did not eat raw hamburger. It does not mean they had a 3.2% greater chance. So to be technically correct, odds ratios should not be reported as a percentage. They should be reported as a decimal. The correct interpretation is to use words such as they had a slightly higher likelihood or they had a slightly higher risk of developing, and I shouldn't even use risk because we're talking about odds. They had slightly higher odds of developing the outcome compared to those who did not. Okay, so I hope that makes sense. Don't fall into the trap even though some studies and even some authors will do that. In some cases, odds ratio results will be very similar to risk ratio results if they were calculated. However, the purist, and you are going to be purists, knows the correct interpretation of an odds ratio is if the value is lower than 1, the outcome is less likely among those in the treatment group or the exposed group compared to those not exposed. If the odds ratio is greater than 1, so if we went back to the smoking, if the odds were a higher number, their outcome, which was lung cancer, is more likely among those who were exposed, it was cigarette smoking, than those who were not exposed. Okay, The larger the number greater than 1, the more likely it is that that outcome will occur if they were exposed. The closer that number is to 1, the lower the likelihood that there will be that outcome. If the number is less than 1, there is a lower likelihood. And if the number was 1, there's equal results. So there was a study that compared erysipelas, which is an infection of the leg, and obesity. And the results reported for this study was an odds ratio of 2.3. Would you correctly interpret this?
so the correct interpretation of this odds ratio equals. This supports the suggestion that obesity increases the risk of developing erysipelas. We said that some people could fall into the trap of saying there's a 2.3% greater risk, but we're not dealing with risks, we're dealing with odds. So it should be there is a positive relationship that if you are obese, you are more likely to also develop infection with erysipelas in your limbs. Odds ratios should typically remain as a decimal rather than a percentage. So don't fall into the trap of saying that 2.3 is equal to 2.3 percent and don't move decimals and say well that fixes it all. It does not. The range of values could be from negative numbers all the way up to infinity and the higher the number, greater than one, the more likely it is that you'll have that outcome if you have the designated exposure. So here we go then. This was a study that looked at increased mortality at day 30 with a diagnosis of active cancer. The odds ratio was reported as 4 and here's my 95 percent confidence interval and if you could cover up the p-value now you've already seen it but look at this if we're doing a ratio calculation I want you to talk to your computer and tell it what is the value of no effect if I'm dealing with any ratio calculation to do that you could always say what would I have to do mathematically to make the number if I had numbers that were the same if there were 10 in the outcomes in the treatment group and 10 out comes in the control group 10 divided by 10 is 1 so the value of no effect you should have answered to your computer for any ratio calculation is 1 does this confidence interval include the value of 1 it does not so if I were only given the confidence interval I could interpret or extrapolate that the p-value is statistically significant here's the p-value what if I ask you or you were interpreting the results section on this study, what does this p-value mean? It means, remember move your decimal to make it a percent, it means there is less than 0.1 percent chance that the results of this study happened by accident. What does the confidence interval tell me? It means that the actual odds ratio was 4, that's the actual value, However, the range of odds ratios ranged from 2.8 to 5.8. Okay, the odds ratio for what? Death if I had a diagnosis of active cancer. So my odds were higher if I had a diagnosis of active cancer of dying at day 30. The actual range of effect, this is where your calculator comes in, so have that calculator handy. Would you take 1 minus 2.8 and you come up with um, well never mind don't do that right now now I'm going to use my men in black pen and make you forget that I had that suggestion your actual odds were from 2.8 up to 5.8 so there was a slightly high risk that if you had an active or diagnosis of active cancer that you would die by day 30 in this study if you had chronic pulmonary disease uh, or excuse me if you had active cancer now we come to another diagnosis what if you had chronic pulmonary disease what were your odds so I look at it and it was 1.3 the confidence interval value does not include the range of 1 if I count from 1.1 up to 1.7 I don't go through the value of 1 it would be down on this side so the p-value will be statistically significant what if I come to this one? What if I had two or more acute illnesses? I look at this odds ratio, I look at the confidence interval range, I know the p-value is going to be statistically significant. How about renal impairment? Okay, I look at those. Do you see these look like they're fairly narrow confidence intervals? Would you agree? This one's probably the widest one. These were all 95 percent confidence intervals, meaning if we repeated the study a hundred times, 95 percent times that the study was repeated the results that you would find would fall within this range 
that. People's odds of dying at 30 days if they had a, a diagnosis of active cancer would fall within 2.8 to 5.8. Okay, now what if I ask you to tell me which of these outcomes, active cancer, chronic pulmonary disease, two or more acute illnesses, or renal impairment, which one increased my odds of death the most? Well, you should be able to pick this one. Active cancer did. Which one had the lowest impact on 30-day mortality? Well, hopefully you picked the, this one. So chronic pulmonary disease had the lowest impact on 30-day mortality. So what does odds ratio mean and what was my interpretation? It said it's the probability that an event will happen, an outcome will happen, in this case 30, death at 30 days, after having some sort of exposure, either diagnosis of active cancer in this study or chronic pulmonary disease or illness. What does it mean? If you had any of these diagnoses, your chance of dying was higher than those in the control group, and that would be it. Okay, relative risk. Well, now we're dealing with, it's actually called risk ratio. So if I remember risk ratio rather than just relative risk. So when I see the initials RR or a study says it reported relative risk, you're going to remember anytime it says relative, that's pretty much the same as saying it was a ratio. So a risk ratio is the risk of outcome in an exposed group compared to the risk of outcome in a control group. But it's calculated differently. So I'm going to go to that Wikipedia site again and let's compare. Here was odds ratios. Do you see how they did the math here? And I can always go back up here for my definitions of what were the pieces I plug in for the math. Now let's look for relative risk, right? So if I go back to the presentation, it says it's called risk ratio or relative risk. So here's relative risk. and sometimes called relative risk reduction, so there's RRR. How do they do the math? Is it the same? We said in some cases people use odds ratios just like they use risk ratios, but you can see the math is not the same. Odds ratio was the events compared to the non-events. This one is the events compared to the total number, right? Events, I'm doing this calculation events compared to the total number of people in the study, the events in the control group compared to the total number of people in the study for the control arm of the study. So they're not the same. Here's how I do the math right here. And what are my values then? Well, they're going to range the effect of anything lower or higher. Again, the value could be up to infinity or the lowest negative number you can think of. So they run both ends of the spectrum. Oh, don't record. Commonly expressed as a percentage. So odds ratios, we're going to leave them as a decimal. Relative risk, we're going to usually report it as a percentage or the authors have reported it as a percentage. It is most commonly found in the results section of randomized trials and cohort studies. So we're going to see a lot of randomized trials in medicine. We are going to see some cohort studies in medicine. So I wouldn't look at a case control study and say it would have been better for them to report relative risk. That is not what you can calculate if you do a case control study. You do odds ratios. With relative risk, it's going to most commonly be seen in randomized trial and cohort studies because the way the studies are set up. So here is that mask study again. Here's the total number of people, total number of people. And what does a relative risk or a relative risk reduction or a uh, risk ratio, all those are the s s different names for the same thing, what does it mean? So how did they get these numbers? They're telling me a relative risk of 
So they took the number of people in a treatment group, and you could do the math here, and if you forget how to do the math and you really want to, if that's the piece that helps you get this, I understand that. It's the piece that makes sense to me. Do you remember the way that we calculated this was the number of events in the treatment group compared to the number of events, the number of participants in the group. So let's first find the treatment group. In most studies they're going to put treatment group first, control group second. Look at this one, they didn't. So I have to make sure I identify what's the treatment group and what's the control group. In this it was to see if, excuse me, I guess this was correct, um, if surgical masks were better than N95 masks. So let's do the math. It should be 48 divided by the total number in the group so if you got your calculator 48 divided by 210 and I should get 22.85 they just rounded that to 22.9 that's already reporting as a percentage 22.9 percent of people who wore N95 respirator masks out of 210 developed confirmed influenza when they wore this mask in the surgical mass group, 50 divided by the actual number in the, the study in that arm. So 212, I had 23.58, so they rounded 23.6% developed it. So what does a relative risk of 23.6% mean? If I look at the results, there were less people here than there were less, or excuse me, there's a lower percentage here than there is here. It means that in this case, there was a 23.6% chance of developing laboratory confirmed influenza if I wore a surgical mask. There was a 22.9% risk if I wore a, an N95 mask. So a person wearing a surgical ma mask in this study had a 23% risk for developing influenza. In this study, a person who wore the N95 respirator mask had a 23, or excuse me, wearing a surgical uh, N95 mask had basically a 23% risk for developing influenza. So that's how you report those results. Now I don't have confidence intervals to look at. So odds ratios and risk ratios or relative risk or relative risk reduction compares the likelihood of an event between two groups. Some studies use the term interchangeably but they are not the same. You can see that mathematically and I've told you so it must be true. Odds ratio are going to be reported typically when we have case control studies. Risk ratios are going to be the more common results we see because it's more likely we see a lot of randomized controlled trials or cohort studies. Do not just look at the RR, the risk ratio or the odds ratio, look at the confidence interval as well. If the confidence interval includes one then there is no statistical significance but you know that you would still need to go on and determine if there was clinical significance. Okay, what does this stuff mean? Let's practice. So orient yourself, this was from the results of a study, the one where they gave anoxaparin, that low molecular weight heparin, which is very pricey, costs about $450 a shot compared to a placebo, so a shot with basically saline. They looked at the risk ratio, so you know, okay, that's percentages. And they reported the risk ratio for what outcome? That's the outcome I don't know. Well, here's my outcomes over here. Death from any cause, cardiopulmonary death, sudden death or, of, or pulmonary embolism at 14 days, and at 30 days they looked at the same outcomes. So I look at this table and I'm saying, is anoxaparin effective at pre preventing 14-day window death from any cause? of cardiopulmonary death or sudden death or pulmonary embolism. Let's look at the results then. They've done the math for you over here. You could do the same thing. All they took was 119. Let me get my paper here. So I don't want to lead you astray. 
if you have your calculator and if you needed to refer back to this website, I'm saying, okay, how did we do that risk reduction, relative risk reduction? So I'm doing this math right here, EER minus CER divided by CER. Okay, so they're doing that math if you want to go through and do the math. Um, if you would take your calculator, if I do 119 divided by 4136, I end up with 2.8 something percent. So there were some decimals that we don't have all the pieces to. If in this anoxaparin group, if I took 121 divided by and a piece got cut off here, I could calculate all of these numbers. There was 4,171 patients in the anoxaparin group. The next thing I do is I go through the second step of the math and they've done all that for me right here. What do the numbers within the parentheses represent? They're telling me that represents the 95% confidence interval. So let's concentrate on this column. They've done the math for me. Let's trust that they did it correctly. What does a risk ratio of 1 mean? Well, just like we interpreted odds ratios, because it's a ratio, the value of no effect is 1. So a risk ratio of 1 would mean there is no difference between for the outcome of death from any cause between the treatment group and the control group. What does the value of 0.9 mean? Well, I can look at the numbers and kind of tell. Can you see that this one's lower than this one? It meant that the risk of cardiopulmonary death was 1% lower in the treatment group compared to the control group. In fact, um, yes. Okay, what is the actual value the actual range of effect, okay, these risk ratios, remember, they could be reported as percentages. So let's do the math then. I guess I don't know that I have to do any math. The value of no effect would be 1, and here's where it gets a little dicey. So do you see that this range crosses the line of no effect? So I know that the p-value would not be significant. Do you see that this range, if I counted from 0.4 up to 1.3, I go through the line of no effect, which would be 1. I know that the p-value won't be statistically significant. None of these will be because they all include the line of no effect. So the correct interpretation of that slide could be that there was no statistical difference between the anoxaparin group and the placebo group for any of the outcomes evaluated. These ones, it's easy to say that. I just say 1, 1, 1, 1. A risk ratio of 1 means there's no effect between the treatment and control group. This one tells me there was a 1% reduction in cardiopulmonary death at 14 days in the anoxaparin group compared to the placebo group. In this one, I could say there was a 3% reduction in the risk of sudden death of pulmonary em or pulmonary embolism in the anoxaparin group compared to the treatment group. Okay, how am I getting 3%? Well, if you take 1 and you subtract 0.7, what do you get? You get 0.3 and that's really 3%. If I take 1 and I subtract 0.9, because remember 1 is the value of no effect, not 0 for these, then I get 0.1. So there's a 10% um, is what I should say, huh? Mm. I would have to double check that they're not reporting these as percentages already and it would mean a 0.23 or, or a 0.1. Okay, so I'd have to go through and do that math. And I didn't do that, I apologize. Okay, the next piece we do is what's the actual range of effect? 
Well, this would mean your chances of dying, how far away is 1.3 from 1? So take 1 minus 1.3, 0.3%. So if these are percentages, there's a 0.3% increase that you uh, had death in the anoxaparin group compared to uh, a 0.2. So your risk was 0.2% lower up to 3% higher. Your risk was, well, 0.3% higher. Your risk was 0.3, remember 1 minus this value. It was 0.3 up to 0.2 higher. 0.3 lower, 0.2 higher. It was 0.6 lower, so 0.6% lower that you would die or lower risk of sudden death or pulmonary embolism compared to the placebo group or your risk was one po was 0.3 percent higher. So I know that can be really confusing. Here's what you have to do with these numbers. If we're dealing with risk ratios, the line of no effect is 1. How far away is 0.8 from 1? I take 1 minus 0.8 and it tells me it's 0.2. So my risk was 0.2 percent lower or if I take 1 minus 1.3, 0.3% higher that I would have death from any cause if I was in the anoxaparin group. All right. Relative risk ratio is also called relative risk reduction, and it's the percentage reduction in the measured outcome between the experimental and control groups. Relative risk reduction is not a good way to compare outcomes. It amplifies small differences and it makes insignificant findings appear significant. If I'm given the choice between relative risk ratio, remember we said that most controlled, randomized controlled trials will report risk ratios. Relative risk ratio, risk ratio, um, risk reduction, those were all names for the same thing. It's a way for a statistician to make their data look better, their, out, their outcomes look better than they really are. You're going to know to use absolute risk reduction instead. Let me go back to this slide. If you were the author, you got to choose to either redo risk ratios or to do absolute risk reduction. You have the percentages here. What's the actual difference between 2.9% and 2.9%? Well, it's zero. What's the actual risk reduction if I looked at the percentage of patients who had cardiopulmonary death in the placebo group and the anoxaparin group? It's 0.1%. What if I did the actual percent difference between this value and this value? Do you see they didn't just do math here. They didn't do 0.7 minus 0.5 and come up with this number. That's not how they got it. This was that calculation that we looked at on Wikipedia. But when you're given the choice, if they give you the risk ratio or the relative risk ratio, you're going to say, I'm not going to use just their data. I'm going to do my own. So I'm going to skip ahead one slide for just a minute. Here is absolute risk reduction, and it's easy to calculate. And I've gone back to the, surgic, or the surgical versus N95 mask study here. It says, what is the actual percentage difference between the outcome group and the, the outcome in the control group and the outcome in the experimental group? So the number cannot be larger than 1 or smaller than negative 1. Let's look at this. Absolute risk reduction. If you have your calculator, would you look at, we're going to take the treatment group compared to the control group, and this study reported absolute risk difference. So the authors did that very well. Instead of just reporting relative risk ratio, they chose to report absolute risk difference. So with your calculator, can you figure out how they got a negative 0.73? What did they subtract from what? See if you can figure that out. And if I went to my Wikipedia to figure out the math, can you see that they did absolute risk reduction or absolute risk increase, because each of those is possible, they just took 
the EER, and remember up here that was the events in the experimental group divided by the total number of patients in the experimental group minus the control group, CER, the events in the control group divided by the total participants there. Now they've already calculated in this study, they'd already calculated your risk all we have to do now is look at this absolute difference. Well, how did they get it? Well, the Wikipedia told me take the treatment group compared to the control group. So 22.9 minus 23.6, I get a minus 0.73. How did they get this number? It's in the treatment group. Remember we said this one's weird because usually they put the treatment group first and the control group second. This one didn't do that, so make sure you always orient yourself to what was the treatment group, what was the control group. So in this one, take 0.5 minus, and that's a percentage already, 2.4, and I get a minus 1.9. So there's some decimals I don't have here. Let's try and see how they got this one. Well, they took 1.4 minus 0.5 and they got 0.95, I got 0.95, they got 0.96. So there, again, there's some decimals they've rounded before they gave me this data. What does it mean? Instead of doing the risk, re, the risk ratio, they calculated the absolute risk difference. And if you're given the values in risk ratio, you can calculate the risk difference just by doing this simple mask. What was the percentage of an outcome, and in this case it was influenza diagnosis, of people who wore the surgical mask compared to the outcome of influenza diagnosis in those who wore the N95 respirator mask? What does a negative value mean? The negative value means that there was a lower risk in patients who wore the N95 respirator mask, but it was only slightly lower. Now, the value of no effect, because we're doing math, we're doing subtraction, right? We did subtraction to get this. The value of no effect is now zero. Okay, so here's where my confidence interval comes in. What is the math if I look at zero minus 1.8? It really is, I guess I shouldn't do that because it will change the decimal. Your risk was actually 8% lower if you wore the surgical mask, or excuse me, the N95 mask of developing influenza, but the actual range of effect was actually 7% higher. So you had an 8% chance, a lower chance that you would develop influenza compared to a 7% higher chance that you'd develop influenza. Okay, what do you think the p-value was then? Well, this range is big. It included the value of no effect, which was zero. How do I know it's zero and not one? This is absolute risk difference, not a ratio. It's not a risk ratio, it's not an odds ratio, it's not a hazard ratio. If it says absolute, chances are the value of no effect, because we're doing simple math, is zero. Okay, what is the value of no effect? It's zero. Did the, this include that range? If I count from negative number up to a positive number, I had to have gone through zero. If I go from a negative number up to a positive number, I have to include zero. So if I ask you to interpret this piece, and let's go, let's just say the outcome here was incidence of influenza, okay? It wasn't, it was something else, but let me give that to you as the outcome. So you'd look at what the outcome is, diagnosis of influenza, what's the actual interpretation of this absolute risk difference? it would be that you had a 1.8% lower risk of developing influenza if I wore the N95 mask. But the actual range of effect was a 4% reduction in the risk of influenza compared to a slight increase in my risk, a 0.36% increase in my risk of influenza. That's how you'd look at the results. So when you're determining statistical significance versus clinical significance, you would factor that in. And here's where that clinical significance came in. Is that clinically significant enough to you to invest in a more expensive mask? Well, you'd, you'd consider that and you'd consult with your patient about that.
Okay, let me go back here now. Hazard ratio. So when do we see hazard ratios? We see them when they're looking at survival data. So the number of patients that died divided by the number of patients who are still alive. Basically, the interpretation is going to be similar to how we interpreted relative risk. So a hazard ratio of 2 does not mean they're 2 times more likely to die, but it does mean that there's a positive relationship. So a number greater than 1, there's an increased risk of the hazard, whatever that outcome is. So death or amputation or allergic reaction whatever they, the outcome is that they're calculating the hazard ratio for, there's a greater chance of that in the treatment group compared to the control group. What if it's a good thing they're looking for? Um, decreased risk of heart disease. We'd want the number to be high. We want an increased risk for that hazard because it may be a positive outcome that they're looking at. So hazard ratios, odds ratios, risk ratios, those all use a value of no effect of 1. Absolute risk reductions, they use a value of no effect of 0. Okay, here's a report that was given the results of hazard ratios. These are hazard ratios over here. And they said death from any cause, cardiopulmonary death, sudden death, or pulmonary embolism. And I should give you these are there. These are their hazard ratios. Here's the 95% confidence interval. And here's your p-values. So if I just gave you the p-values, what do you already know about your confidence intervals? Well, they must include the range of no effect. And because this is a ratio, the value or point of no effect is 1. Does 0.8, if I counted from 0.8 up to 1.1, does that range include the value of 1? Yes. Does this range include the value of 1? Yes. Does this range include the value of 1? Yes. So therefore, none of these will be statistically significant. Is it clinically significant? If I could reduce 90-day mortality of death from any cause, well, this one was equal between the treatment group and control group, but the actual range was there was not an 8% reduction, there was a 1 minus 0.8, there was a 0.2% reduction, up to a 0.1% increase in death. Cardiopulmonary death, there was a 0.2% decrease up to a 0.2% increase. In this one, there was a 0.3 in the way I get that. Remember, the value of no effect is 1. If it was 0, I would use the 0.7, but it's not. How far away is this number from 1? It's only 0.3. So 0.3% reduction in sudden death or pulmonary embolism in the treatment group compared to the control group up to a 0.6% increase. So is there statistical significance? No. Based on the p-values or the confidence intervals that include the value of no effect, is there clinical significance? No. It looks like your risk is really the same. There's a lower risk or a higher risk or a lower risk or a higher risk in the treatment group. So I'm really not convinced that I would give the anoxaparin, which is kind of funny because we give low molecular weight heparins to almost every patient in our intensive care unit with a goal of preventing sudden death due to pulmonary embolism. Okay, Number needed to treat. To calculate a number needed to treat, I need an ARR. I need an absolute risk reduction because NNT is the reciprocal of absolute risk reduction. What is number needed to treat? It can also be called, if it were a harmful outcome, it could be the number needed to harm. So if the event is negative, like how many people had to have this exposure to have a myocardial infarction or a heart attack compared to those who didn't. Number needed to treat is recognized as the most clinically useful statistic. It represents the number of patients who must be treated to prevent one adverse outcome. That's number needed to treat or the number who must be treated before we have a negative outcome, number needed to harm. And these are calculated exactly the same, it's just if we're looking at a positive thing, we call it number needed to treat. If we're looking at a negative outcome, we would call the result a number needed to harm. 
What does it mean that it's a reciprocal of ARR? Well, to interpret NNT, this is how we calculate it. I need the absolute risk difference first. So if I did my math here, remember we took this number, this percentage, subtract this percentage. So this value is reported as a percentage. It tells me that right here. This is 0.73%. So if I took 100 divided by 0.73, because it was a percentage, or if I converted this to a decimal and used the value of 1 on top. So that's the place that you could get confused when you're calculating number needed to treat. If the study didn't give it to you, if they reported risk ratios, we've gone through how you could calculate the absolute risk reduction or absolute risk difference. If I have the absolute risk reduction, I can calculate NNT. If it's a reported as a percentage, I divide the results into 100 because it's the reciprocal, the opposite. If it is reported to me as a decimal, I divide it into the value of 1. In this case, both of these mathematical calculations get me a result of 137. What does that mean? That we had to have 137 healthcare workers use an N95 respirator mask to cause one less case of influenza. So it's up to you to decide if that number is clinically significant. ARR is calculated by doing the risk in the treatment group minus the risk in the control group. We knew how to do that. ARR, in this case, right, we find the treatment group. So find the treatment group find the control group, here's my placebo group. So if I did the math, I look at these are percentages. 2.9 minus, oh I guess I did it for a different value, I did it for this one right here, 30 day death from any cause. 4.9, got your calculator there, minus 4.8 percent, because to do absolute risk reduction we're taking the risk the relative risk, and those have been calculated for us here, 4.8, and I get a 0.1, 0.1%. So 0.1% divided into 100, it means that I have to treat a thousand patients with anoxaparin to prevent one death from any cause during this 30-day mortality window. Boy, that's a high number needed to treat, isn't it? If this is a drug that's expensive, and I told you it costs about $420 an injection and you're going to get one of those every day, is it really worth it to give it to a thousand patients just to prevent one outcome here? If I look at pulmonary embolism, if I did my math, it's going to be, it's going to be basically um, 100, excuse me, um, oh, I don't know if I can do the math here. 0.7 minus 0.7 and so I end up with 100 divided by 0 and I can't do that so I really can't even do the number needed to treat here. There's no reason to treat because there's no difference. Absolute versus relative results. Physicians, patients, and policymakers are influenced not only by the results of studies but also how the authors present the results. So there is a quote that says, there's lies, damn lies, and statistics. It says that when you are the author of a study, you're doing just like a politician in most cases. You're trying to figure out what would be the best sound bite. Statistical methods can be chosen, which make the effect of an intervention look very large or quite small. Here is an example. Oh, I'm getting to that in a minute. I guess I have a slide out of order. The next couple of slides deal with what's called forest plots. And in the last video I talked about these box and whisker diagrams. Now if we combine all these together, and we might see that just to report the results on many outcomes, we might also have these to report the results of a systematic analysis. As you look at this, part of your job, or one of the outcomes for the 
the learning outcomes for this section for the results of the Marie framework is that you'll be able to interpret a forest plot so very quickly when I look at a forest plot that's for a systematic analysis it's telling me the studies that they used these are the authors and the dates they were published it's telling me the results of the study as far as the confidence interval and if you look at this 0.5 to 2.6 look down here here's 1 2 and 3 0.5 to 2.6 look at this one 1 to 3.4 1 over to 3.4. So the confidence intervals here, the ranges match up with the values here. What is the outcome they're reporting here? They're recording, reporting odds ratios. So why is there a line at 1? Because line is the no treatment effect. If we have risk ratios or hazard ratios or odds ratios, the line of no effect is 1. What does it mean when a confidence interval crosses this line? that the range includes the value of no effect. This one, remember it started at 1. It touched the line, but it didn't cross it, so that would still be statistically significant. This one, it did include, barely did it, right? What if I wasn't sure if it touched the line or not? I could look right here. Did this cross the line? Well, I look here and it says no, it only went to 1. It did not cross the line look at the width of the confidence intervals and I could look at it mathematically or I can look at it graphically. Which of these studies has the narrowest confidence interval? The shorter the whiskers, the narrower the confidence intervals and that would be a positive thing. Typically the shorter the whiskers, the higher the power and that's what this these boxes represent. The study size is the box. So the power or the number of people in this study is what's represented by the size of these boxes. So which of these studies had the lowest number of participants? Well it was these two. Which had the highest? This one looks like it's slightly larger than this one. What's the relationship between the number of people in the study and the power or what is the thing that makes um, the confidence interval most likely to be narrow? It's the number of people in the study. The next thing we see is the average of all these studies combined together into one test. And here is a diamond which represents the confidence interval range for combining all of these studies as if they were one large study. That's what a systematic review does, is combine the data from individual studies as if they were one large study and they're showing you by the size of the diamond the confidence interval range and they're showing you with this line the average value. So here is a confidence interval that was reported in a meta-analysis on the impact of treatment on mortality so some sort of treatment and I don't remember what it was for and I've got an odds ratio mean, I've got the confidence interval lower limit, upper limit, so I've got the confidence interval ranges here. If they didn't tell me that it was for odds ratios, I'd look here and say what were the outcome they were looking for. So here's odds ratio and 95% confidence interval because those whiskers represent the confidence interval. I then look at here's this value of no effect. So this author did a nice job of actually having this scaled correctly. So 0.1 and 10 are exact mathematical opposites or reciprocals of each other. 0.1 and 100 are exact matches for each other. Sometimes they'll have like 1, 10, 100 and then they have might have 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.3. So you do have to look at how they've actually selected to spread things across the, the graph. Things that are lower than 1 because it's an odds ratio favor treatment. Things that are greater than 1 mean the outcome was negative and so they would favor placebo. Okay, what does the size of the box represent? Answer that to your computer. What's the size of this box mean? Like this one compared to this one. The size of the box is the number of people in the study and therefore it can almost be interpreted to mean the power of the study. What does the range of the whiskers mean? 
So which of these studies has the shortest confidence interval? I hope that you picked this one. The narrowest confidence interval of these studies was this one, the Stewart study. How do I know that? Small whiskers. And I had a large box, which is probably going to help me anticipate that because they had a large power or study size, they will have a narrow confidence interval. What did their study show? It showed that it favored treatment. When the authors put all of these studies together, they're telling me that whatever treatment this was, it had a positive outcome on mortality. Your odds of dying were lower if you took whatever treatment this was, but is it a very significant number? Well, only 0.1 compared to it could have been infinity over here. So I guess it's better than point, and it wasn't even point 0.1. The actual result was 0.32, excuse me, 0.328 with a range of effect of point, eh, it's not what I wanted to do, of 0.23 right here to 0 0.462. 0 0.462 up to 0 0.233 if I actually drew those down and matched them up on this scale. So my odds were slightly lower of dying if I had this treatment compared to the placebo. Okay, what does this mean? So this is vaccination for preventing cholera. Orient yourself to the table. What's the outcome? The outcome is relative risk. They're reporting 95% confidence intervals with the whiskers. If I just looked quickly, a risk ratio lower than one, in this case favors vaccination, a risk ratio higher than one favors placebo. Just looking very quickly, can you see how few of these studies cross the value of no effect? So a number of these studies showed that having vaccination reduced your risk of developing cholera. What does this specific diamond mean? When all of these studies were combined as if they were one big study, the results actually were a mean of, and here's where they're telling me that, a mean of 0.35, a relative risk of 0.35, and those are, they don't tell me if they're reported as percents or not, compared, and the actual effect was 0.18 up to 0.67. So there was a, remember you can do your calculator, so 1 minus 1.8, if you want to play along, means that there was a, I did my math wrong, up to a 0.08% reduction, because this is risk ratio, I can use percent, but the actual range was 0 0.08 up to 1 minus, and now I'm going to use this 0.67. So up to 0.4% reduction in development of cholera. So you say, well, it's all statistically significant, except this one that crossed the line of no effect, but it's not clinically significant maybe if this medication costs a lot of money. If it only costs a penny on the dollars, it does show that it would be statistically significant and clinically significant, but realize it's only representing a 0.1% reduction, or lower than that even, in my incidence of cholera in the vaccinated group compared to the non-vaccinated group. So I'd consider how bad is cholera, how much do people suffer with cholera, how much does the vaccination cost, and I would explain those things to my patient and together we would make a decision on whether they take the vaccine. Okay, relative versus absolute values. Here's a good example of how authors might choose to report data that makes their study look more impactful. So if I had a rehab program for heart attack patients and program A reduced death rates by 20%, program B had an absolute risk reduction of deaths in eight in, as of 
Program C increased patient survival from 84 to 87 percent, and Program D meant that 33 people were needed to be enter the program to avoid one death. Do you realize this is all examples of how we might report exactly the same data? Reduce death rates by 20 percent. All that's doing is a relative risk reduction. Program B, an absolute risk reduction, it was really only a 3% reduction. It reduced death rates by 20%, but the actual value, the difference between the two was 84 to 87, that's 3%. So here's the confidence interval range for risk ratios. Here is the absolute risk reduction, right, 87 minus 84 is 3 and 33 people needed to be needed to enter the program to avoid one death that's doing the NNT it's 100 divided by 3 if you have your calculator play along 100 divided by 3 33.33% or 33.33 people need to enter the program to avoid one death so all of these say the same thing. Which of these do you think would get the most attention if you were going to put it in the newspaper? Well, this isn't very catchy, is it? This isn't very catchy. This is pretty significant. You put 33 people in the study to prevent one death, but this is what a lot of authors will choose to report. And we said, if you're given relative risk ratio or relative risk reduction you are able then to calculate absolute risk and if I have absolute risk I can do number needed to treat. So I hope this has helped. Which is best then? Is it best to use relative risk reduction which is also known as risk reduction or absolute risk reduction? You better know when possible take that extra step, do the math and calculate the absolute risk reduction. All right, you've survived the second portion of this statistics stuff. But there will be more fun coming. I have to find the button to turn this off. Sorry. Oh, I need that screen. Let me get to it this way. Okay, I'm done taping.
is this recording? A whole thing you did A whole did. hour. I did two. I got the one. This one says not responding, which is never good. But we'll see. So somewhere it's like, I know I've seen it. Well, I can get some. Oh, I just, okay. it's called baby faces and it's in a tube like this, big chapstick. Oh, okay. Kind of like that one baby. Okay. 